All right, welcome back to the second video. It's 3.35 in the afternoon now on the 7th of June. And we're gonna talk about the American Revolution and what happens after the revolution takes place. So in May of 1776, the Second Continental Congress is going to meet and this is gonna be the Congress that leads us through war. Now, war is not gonna be their first goal. They do want to try and find peace. And not everybody is willing or prepared to go to war at this point. Uh, one thing that the Second Continental Congress does agree to do is to write a letter to King George III. And this becomes known as the Olive Branch Petition. Uh, the colonists, they profess their continued loyalty to George III. They beg him for reconciliation. And it's going to be rejected. The king says no. And the king says... Uh, the army is to treat the colonists as open and avowed enemies. So war is going to happen, even though it's not what anybody wants. Um, not everybody supports the war, and I think a lot of people are surprised about this. The number of people who supported the war, about 40%, less than half. About 40% were neutral, and about 20% were loyal and did not want to leave Britain. So if less than half of the people wanted to go to war, how did that change? Ultimately, it's one person, a man named Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine writes a pamphlet or an essay called Common Sense. And Common Sense is going to be very influential. He gives several arguments as to why the colonies should be on their own. He gives a political argument. He gives a financial argument, a military argument, a religious argument, you name it. And common sense is going to be written in everyday language. It's going to be written in a way anybody can understand. There's something in it that will appeal to you, if not multiple things. And Thomas Paine, more than anybody else, is able to sway the revolution and get people on board with it. Now, there were also two very different strategies. The British strategy, they're going to treat this like they would any other European war. That means that they're going to try and control the cities, they're going to try and defeat the enemy in a military victory, and they're going to march their armies back and forth. The American strategy, however, it's basically duck and run. They're going to play defense. They're going to hit the enemy and then run away. And their goal, the only way the Americans are going to succeed, is if they find somebody to help them, and if they win over the people. So two very, very different strategies are gonna play out. There are a lot of battles that happen. I have a list of battles here, and I don't even think you need to know all of these. Um, but what I will tell you is that the Battle of Long Island is the first battle, and it is a huge loss for George Washington. Uh, you have the Saratoga campaign where uh, Nathaniel Green is going to fight the British in upstate New York, and this prevents the British from taking over control of New York City. And then we have Valley Forge. Valley Forge is not a battlefield or anything like that. It was a campground. And in the winter of 1777 going into 1778, Valley Forge is where President, well, soon to be President, I should say General Washington, is going to have the army spend the winter. Now, Washington asks for supplies to be there waiting for him. There aren't any. Um, there's no shelter, no food. Um, thousands of people are going to die of frostbite and exposure. Uh, some smallpox is going to go through the camp. And it's a real tough winter. But it is at Valley Forge that the American army becomes a professional army. This guy from Prussia, which is basically Eastern Germany today, named Baron von Steuben, is going to come to Americas and volunteer to train Washington's army. Um, France has some people here who are observing, and they observe what Baron von Steuben is doing with Washington's army, and they decide to get involved once they think that the Americans have a chance to win. Now fast forward to the end of the war, 1781, we have the Battle of Yorktown. Now the Battle of Yorktown happens in Virginia along the coast, and it was never supposed to be the final battle, it just kind of happens. Um, the British have the strongest navy in the world, 
and General Cornwallis is going to camp for the winter right on the coast of Virginia. He's waiting for the Navy to show up with supplies and reinforcements, but the British Navy never gets there. The French Navy cuts them off and then the Americans and the French are going to blockade the city of Yorktown. Uh, Cornwallis is going to surrender, but only after he's convinced there's no other choice. And so Cornwallis is going to surrender to this joint American-French army on October 7th, 1781, and America is going to win the War of Independence. This is the Treaty of Paris, 1783. This is ultimately what's going to end the American Revolution. And when you really look at it and you read these, it's a very pro-American treaty. Uh, the English give up basically anything that the Americans want. So the United States is free and sovereign. The British government has no claim on it anymore. The boundaries are established. Fishing rights are established. And then finances are established, like money will be used to pay off debts. Any seized or taken territory will be, the loyalists will get money. No further land taken away. Prisoners are going to be released. And it's a much friendlier thing than one would expect. Now the task of creating the government is really going to start with state governments uh, because these states are going to be operating before the war is over. Uh, all the states are going to write down constitutions. They don't trust unwritten ones, and that's because Britain, even today in 2023, there's no written constitution. So they want to see it down in front of them on paper. Uh, most of the states are going to have a strong legislature. I think all but two of them are bicameral. There's a purposely weak governor, and that governor is going to be elected by the legislature. And then the judiciary is going to be independent, and they cannot be appointed by outside help. There is a Bill of Rights put into the state governments, um, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, things like that. And it turns out that these first state governments are very ineffective. They are very slow to work because the executive is so weak. There's no one person who's the point man. And because the legislation is so slow and people can't agree, there's not a whole lot that gets done. And before you know it, on the state level, several constitutions have to be rewritten before people begin being anything close to happy. The first national government that this country has isn't truly a national government. The United States, as originally envisioned, was going to be 13 independent states that operated together when needed, kind of like what the European Union is today. So the Articles of Confederation, as it becomes known, uh, it goes into effect in 1777. On the, the national level, there's only one house of the legislature that is called unicameral government. Each colony had one representative. There's no executive branch. So almost nothing gets done because we can't get people to agree. Uh, the closest example to this would be the European Union today. It's not a perfect example, but it will give you an idea of how our government was originally supposed to work. Now, with that being said, the powers that the national government had under the AOC were very, very small. Um, the national government could settle disputes between states. It could regulate foreign affairs. It could set the value of currency. Um, it had the power to, well, actually it didn't. It did not have the power to tax. It had the power to ask for money, but it couldn't demand you pay them, and it couldn't get any tax money because taxes didn't exist. Also, it has no power to enforce its decisions. It, it's like me sitting here in front of this webcam telling you what your family can and cannot do. It's unrealistic at best. Now, this is probably not a surprise to you, but the Articles of Confederation were really, really weak, and that's because nothing could get done. Everything required unanimous consent. 
Uh, it's not even until the, the year 1780 that the Articles of Confederation goes into effect because each state interpreted the Treaty of Paris a little bit differently. Each one wanted different things, and the Articles of Confederation, the president of the board, um, had no power whatsoever. So, did this government under the Articles of Confederation do anything good? The answer is yes. Uh, they came up with something known as the Northwest Ordinance. And the Northwest Ordinance is going to be the upper Midwest today. And with the Northwest Ordinance, those states or territories were able to take care of themselves. So each of the states handled their foreign relations a little bit differently. Uh, each of the states interpreted the Treaty of Paris a little differently. But everybody agreed that the Northwest Territories, the part of the country like Ohio, not, well, I think Ohio was in there, Western Ohio was in there, um, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, those places that have some sort of um, protection Well, I should say this, the people were given some sort of protection. So, um, Also, slavery is going to be um, banned from those territories. And then last but not least, uh, the Northwest Ordinance, the um, future states are going to be treated just like any other state. So there's no hierarchy of states. There's no earning your stripes, so to speak. Once you come in under the Northwest Ordinance, then new states have all the rights and privileges of the old states. So, upper Midwest, no slavery allowed, Bill of Rights is guaranteed, and equality. So, that's really the only success that I know of that the Articles of Confederation had. Uh, but it turns out very quickly that it doesn't work. It, it just... You can't get 13 people to agree on one thing. So a convention is going to be called. And on the in 1786, there's going to be representatives from five states who are going to join together. They're going to discuss trade policy. The problem is those representatives can't do anything because you need unanimous consent from all 13 states. So anything that those five states decide on, it's not going to do any good. So that meeting disbands. And letters are sent out to all 13 governments asking and begging people to show up the next year in 1787. At the same time that's happening in Massachusetts, uh, the taxes are really high, the, the uh, economy is not doing so well, and farmers are losing their farms. So these farmers in Massachusetts are going to ask to have paper money printed by their state government. The state government thinks about it, but then says no, because all the people who are owed money, they don't want to accept dollar bills. So a group of farmers led by a American revolutionary veteran named Daniel Shea are going to rebel and they're going to attack a gun arsenal in Springfield, Massachusetts. Now the Massachusetts a militia is going to put this down very quickly. Um, it still terrifies people and it makes people afraid. And before you know it, um, 1787 comes around, the Congressional Confederation, or the Confederation Congress, however you want to put it, they meet and they decide, yeah, we need to do something because the Articles of Confederation are not working. Now the problem with this convention is that only 12 states send delegates. Rhode Island doesn't bother to, to show up. So they have to decide, what do we do? 12 out of 13 of us are here. And they decide, you know what, let's, let's just see what happens. Let's go off the chart. Let's just, just meet and we'll do business with those 12 states. If the 13th one wanted to be here and say something, they should have, but they didn't. So we have 55 total delegates are mostly middle class wealthy or they're um, fairly well educated. They're definitely the elite. And these 55 delegates are going to represent 12 of the 13 states. Most of the work is going to be done by a group of 12 led by James Madison. 
and to prepare for this meeting, James Madison is going to read just about every political book he can find. At the end of the day, there are going to be two plans presented, the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan. The New Jersey plan would basically keep things as they were. The Articles of Confederation or a form of it would stay over the country, but they would be written that to provide specific rights, like um, the ability for the, the government to do things it hadn't done previously. So, in other words, the New Jersey plan would have kept the Articles of Confederation the way they were, but give the government just a little bit more bite. The Virginia plan, though, was going to change everything. Uh, we're going to have an executive elected by Congress. We're going to have an independent judiciary. Um, your representation in Congress and the House of Representatives was going to be based on population and popular vote instead of just everybody's equal. While the small states don't really like the Virginia plan, the big states don't really like the New Jersey plan. So in the end, some delegates from Connecticut are going to join together and they're going to take pieces from the Virginia plan, they're going to take some pieces from the New Jersey plan, and they're going to come up with something that looks very, very similar to what we have today. So Congress is going to be based on population. The Senate is going to be based on equality. Uh, we're going to have a national judiciary that is independent. We're going to have an executive that's elected by the people. But more than anything, everybody is going to have a say and it's going to be equal. Um, so we have 12 out of 13 states. Technically, they can't do anything, but they say, you know what, let's send it out and see what happens. And they decide that if nine states approved this new government, that this new government would go into place. So in September of 1787, the plan is ready and they send it out for verification. We're going to skip this right here. But basically, there, there are going to be two sides in this argument. There is a group known as the Federalists and there's a group known as the Anti-Federalists. The Federalists, they're okay with this new constitution. They like it the way it is. They think that the 55 representatives did a good job. And typically, those who are for this constitution as it's written, they're going to be the middle class and upper class. They want a strong central government. They think that there are enemies out there that the government needs to protect people from. And they write something called the Federalist Papers where they lay out their position and why they think it's okay. Madison, Hamilton, and John Jay, who goes on to become the first Supreme Court Justice, are the ones who are like, yeah, let's, let's go with this new plan. The Anti-Federalists, they didn't like the Constitution as written because they wanted and demanded a Bill of Rights. The people who wrote the Constitution, they didn't put the Bill of Rights in there because each state had its own Bill of Rights. But the Anti-Federalists said, what if the states make a change? What if the new states that come in don't put a Bill of Rights in there? What do we do? So the Anti-Federalists, they believed that it was the job of the government to protect them and they also believe that people should have individual rights. Uh, these are people like Thomas Jefferson and Patrick Henry, and they wrote the Anti-Federalist Papers, where they argued why the small farmer and those without money need to specifically be protected. So two very, very different points of view, and I want to leave it to you to read more about them. But ultimately what happens is in September of 1787, the Constitution is put out for ratification. States begin to ratify the Constitution, the first ones in December of 1787. And by June of 1788, nine states have ratified it and it goes into effect. If you're curious about the ones that did not ratify it right away, New York didn't like it. Virginia didn't like it. North Carolina didn't like it. And Rhode Island barely existed and they weren't interested at all in this. So that's how the Constitution comes to be and it develops into the the government system we have today with a couple of slight tweaks and changes. All right, so that's it for this video. It's another 20 minutes or so. Uh, I hope you do watch it. 
And I'll tell you what, send me an email saying that you watched this video and I will give you a bonus quiz grade. So all you have to do is send me an email saying I watched all 20 minutes. And if you do that, I'll give you a bonus grade in the gradebook. All right, until next time, we'll see you later. Have a good week.